Hello and welcome to the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, the latest hotness, and how to have fun with your friends, even when you're losing. Today, episode 105. My name is Kellen, and I'm joined, as always, by Mark and Neelan. Hey! Hello! You have returned from South Africa. Yeah. From the land down under. That's... (laughs) It's one of the other lands down under, but not the one we all are super familiar with. Are the... Bloomin' onions <laughs> in South Africa, good. Yeah, they're, they're better. Even better than the Australian ones. <laughs> Closer to the source, yeah. right? <laughs> Welcome to 2020. What we wanted to talk about today was board gaming and our resolutions for the year 2020. 2020, even saying it, just feels like the future. It does. Yeah. We have just completed our top 50 board games of all time. You can listen to that. We're very excited to be back to your regularly scheduled programming. Before we talk about our board game resolutions for the year, we will talk about the games that we have been playing over the holiday break. So, Neelan, what have you been playing? A couple of things. I played not as many board games over the holiday season as I would have loved to with Dear Family, but I did play a lot of Deep Sea Adventure. I just want to say really quickly, this was a huge, huge hit. That's awesome. Like, my dad's never really played board games a lot with us growing up. He got into Deep Sea Adventure in a big way, won a couple of games. It was great. We played this basically on repeat three times in a row at one point. It was a game that I could play with my younger brother as well, which is something I can't do super often. So Deep Sea Adventure is the press your luck oink game where almost always everyone dies and you run out of air and it's hilarious because you share an air source and everyone's just trying to get treasure. Did you find over like a repeated plays over a certain set of time that people actually scored points and, and there was strategic depth to it because i think that's a common criticism yeah absolutely and then that's actually the thing i wanted to say is because i've only played this actually a couple of times before and i feel like every time i've played it i played it with new players and no one gets past the learning curve of knowing how to score at all because what happens inevitably in most games of deep sea adventure is everyone runs out of air and everyone dies before anyone has gone back to the sub and you play a couple of rounds so generally that irons out in rounds two and three but it still takes a little while to understand how to score at all net limb mind scoring well but especially playing three full games of this as in three rounds each by the time we got into you know the fourth fifth sixth rounds people are sort of very actively understood how to do well like don't pick up anything on the way down make sure you're timing out when you think the air is going to run out and then even dropping treasure on the way back so you can make it back safely stuff that just didn't click in even in the first few times i played it everyone was getting because we were all learning it together i think that's one of the things that's so smart about deep sea adventure is when you die when the ship runs out of air you tend to all suffer together so there is this kind of it's not quite semi co-op but it's this idea that if i tank us we're all going down together so we all have to sort of learn how to play well together so you sort of start to like feed off a little bit of people's ego yeah because some people will sort of despite learning the lesson or despite knowing the lesson still get greedy right and then you just go oh god jason yeah. <laughs> really again and then everyone reacts to that and knows how to play appropriately yeah i had a good time with it and i think we all did really and it was a game that i was excited to take home because i suspected it was a game that everyone would pick up quickly but i was still surprised by how much everyone took to it it's a game that i feel like in the oink canon it doesn't always seem to get as much love as i think we these i seem to well i don't even have it in my top 50 anymore okay yeah i can see that because after the first few times i played it like i was sort of like ah is this great really interesting because i i've always considered as like the main oink game oh interesting i felt like if you asked people who are into board games but not necessarily like deep in board games to name an oink game my guess would have been if they were to name one it would be, would be that adventure yeah. yeah yeah for whatever reason it wasn't one that i sort of held in high esteem the one thing i knew about it it was it was is accessible yeah because it's a game that i will typically i remember borrowing it from you at some point kellen to sort of take to complete non-gamers and be like hey this will be something that you will pick up and get and even if it didn't necessarily go great they got it and we were playing a game but yeah, seeing it get picked up quickly and enjoyed thoroughly was really like one of the highlights of my board games over the holidays. I love hearing that your dad got really into yeah, it. I, no. I love when parents or people who are non-gamers who, that, that you're close to totally connect and, and really get into a game like that. It's awesome. I would have to say, like in all of my time growing up, I don't remember a time where we were all five of us actively playing a game, yeah, enjoying it together. Because sure. typically, like I might play like Scrabble with my mom or something else on the side with my older brother, but all five of us just in one game together and 
and actively enjoying it was, was great. fantastic. So that's Deep Sea Adventure. Moving on from that, we all just played a few games of Point Salad here at the table. This is a game that came out from AEG last year. It is a very simple drafting game. There's a deck of cards which are double-sided. On one side they have one of six different vegetables and on the other side they have a way to score different combinations of vegetables. So say a scoring card might be get four points for every onion but lose two points for every tomato or every combination of onion plus cabbage plus lettuce gets you eight points. On your turn, you're either going to take two vegetables or take a scoring card and you keep playing until all of the cards have been taken. There are some interesting considerations because the cards are double-sided. If you take a scoring card, you can later flip it over to the corresponding vegetable on the other side, which gives you some flexibility later down in the line. If you're like, oh, I desperately need this vegetable to fill out a set, so you might sacrifice a scoring card to turn it into a vegetable that's worth more points for you. There's a little bit of looking around the table, seeing Kellen's going heavy on carrots, so I might want to make sure that Kellen doesn't get all the carrots. There's enough fun little considerations in the game that's super easy to teach and plays really quickly. The game encourages you to play multiple rounds of it. In fact, depending on the player count, the deck splits neatly into the appropriate number of cards. So in a three-player game, we just divide the deck into two, play two games straight, and combine our scores. Super simple. What did you guys think of Point Salad? Well, I know that Kellen likes carrots because both of them and his name start with the same letter. So I knew going in he was going to go heavy into carrots. Yeah, that's it's been 105 episodes and you don't know how to spell <laughs> my name. <laughs> that's great. Congratulations, sir. I thought it was a game that'd be really simple to teach and I can see playing it with, again, non-gamer friends to introduce them to the idea of drafting and set collecting. We played two games in under 30 minutes for sure, maybe even under 20 minutes. That said, I don't really get the hype with gamers because I feel like the reviews on this have been almost unreservedly positive. And it's fine. It's a totally fine game. But we played two rounds of it and I would have been fine not playing the second round. I didn't dislike it. I absolutely did not dislike it. But it just seemed just just okay. Just just okay. I think that how frictionless a turn is yeah. is laudable because it's essentially draft two vegetables, take a scoring card, or if you see a scoring card that you don't want someone else to take, make sure you take a vegetable under that row so that they can't get that scoring card. And so the turns are going lightning fast. And about halfway through the first game, I was ready to be very excited and purchase my own copy. And then we arrived at the end of the round, and for such a lightning fast, quick action game scoring the thing is annoying as hell because it's like well i have seven carrots and that's minus two plus one minus two and you're adding it up to get to 49 points the end of the rounds are quite annoying in my opinion the joke of the theme point salad um, is abhorrent to me (laughs) okay wow it's like they did it all for the laughs you know like the art is cute but it's vegetables like who wants this isn't the phrase they did it for the lulls for the laughs Okay, I thought that was a hip way to say it. Who could say? Who could say? But it's just the joke is that in a point salad board game, there's a lot of different ways to score points. And in this game, you're constantly picking up new cards that score in a different way. So, ha ha, AEG, ha ha. But people seem to genuinely like, I mean, from what I've read, it seems to be almost unanimously positive reviews. Yeah, I like it. I think I like it more than you do. Yeah, okay. So I think it's very much in the same territory of something like Sushi Go, right? And one of the things that I think that struck me about it is in some ways, like I said, it's very frictionless. It's easier to explain than Sushi Go even, I would say. And I think it has the same appeal to non-gamers. And that is not perhaps as cute as Sushi Go, but it's cutesy, it is bright colors. You get the feel that you know what you're going for. It's like in the same way that you might, oh, I need to get wasabi this turn yeah. what have you in Sushi Go right. you know oh I need to get that onion you get excited when you see onions because sure. like I'm just going to grab two onions on my turn like I think there is an appeal to that that a lot of people that aren't familiar with a lot of games would gravitate to very quickly this is a game that I feel like I would be excited to very quickly break out with people that don't play a lot of board games in the same ballpark as Sushi it's Go it's interesting you bring up Sushi Go because my first plays of that were with people who aren't into board games and I ended up loving the game just because they were so into it right. and it got me so into it I wonder if I had played this initially with that same group if i would have a more positive opinion of it and again just to be clear like i don't think it's bad it's just sort of just fine yeah but the reason i want to sort of specify this with sushi go because sushi go is not a game i am excited for but i like you said i love playing it with other people it's a game i love showing to people 
Point salad, I don't know. It, it didn't excite me. I got to the end of the game and I kind of, we were all kind of just surprised of the way the points ended up being. We were just one apart, coincidentally, probably. But it didn't feel like what we were doing correlated to the points we were getting necessarily. I didn't feel like I knew I was winning. It was just, oh, out of the points, I got this number and who knew why or how that happened. But it was fun to do it. I liked grabbing vegetables. Yeah. And it was so, again, so fast. That's kind of what's yeah. saying. Turns are rapid fire, sort of like an ethnos sort of feeling where it just right. flies around the table. Totally. That's Point Salad by AEG. Mark, what have you been playing? I played Atelier, the painter studio, another game by AEG. We got this as a review copy. Thanks for the invite. I want to play it. You were home for the holidays with your family. I didn't want to you break up that liar. lovely. You are lying. Warm I can heart see it in your eyes. Home. Well, you are going to thank me for not coming to play this game because <laughs> it is not very good in my opinion. What you're doing in Atelier is you're rolling dice and you are on your turn assigning the dice to different actions based on the die face. You can use the die to pick up paint cans of one of, I think, four or five different colors. You can use them to get more students. It has an area control aspect where you're putting your students in front of different colors of paint. And if you have the most students in front of a certain color, you're more likely to get that color of paint. You're acquiring this paint in an effort to basically complete recipes that are depicted on cards that have, truth be told, lovely works of art on the, uh, the conceit is that you're painters in a painter studio. The cards that you're trying to acquire have uh, unique pieces of art that are all lovely. The cards are, I don't think they're quite tarot size, but they're quite big and they're, again, very beautiful. When you get the cards, they give you points. Some cards give you powers. The game moves very, very quickly. First person to get three masterpiece cards which are maybe a third of the deck are considered masterpiece cards that are a little more difficult to acquire first person to get three of them triggers the end of the game and then you score so this is clearly a game that is meant to be played with people who are looking for games like points out like lightweight games it's a game that you might bring out to non-gamers to instead of showing them drafting or set collection like you would in points out or sushi go this is something you might introduce them to like dice manipulation or recipe fulfillment or even area control the way you get paints is an area control quality to it the thing is that the decisions are quite light and there's also a snowballing factor in this game where a player who gets some paints and start acquiring paintings that give them powers typically because the game is so short there's not much time to catch up the other players are sort of trying to play catch up for the rest of the game and that would be fine if there was a little more meat to the game if there was a little more decisions to be had or or struggle or something but in fact it's just such a light game that you look up and you sort of realize that you're not going to win because somebody else has acquired all these powers and the game is sort of over. And I can see some people liking it, but it's, for me, a step beneath points out in the sort of madness. It's just all right. So it sounds like reading between the lines, you lost the game and now hate it. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's fair. This is just like uh, tapestry. Tapestry problem. That's right. <laughs> no, I won tapestry and I still hated it. You did not beat me in our first game of time. Okay, but I beat Neil in, yeah. in both games. Well, did I beat Neil? No, no, you beat me in, a, in, in your second, second game. game. In fact, I had this high score he'd ever seen. And look how that turned out. <laughs> they didn't balance the shit out of that game afterwards, right, Mark? <laughs> they didn't change the point value of three-fourths of the factions in the game, right. did they, Mark? Well, he listened to me. I think Jamie listened to my criticism and said, hey, that guy's got something. So that is out at the air. You know, it's a pass for me, but... All I could think about was Fresco, another game about painting for Euros that I don't I like. like. Fresco. No. You don't like it? No. I like Fresco. Fresco has a lot more to it than Atelier. If you're looking for a painting-themed game, definitely Fresco above Atelier. If what you've been craving... <laughs> but we got painters in the audience. Yeah. They're looking for painting-themed games. Fair. I had the opportunity to play so many board games over the holiday break. So many board games. Got to try Monolith Arena for the first time, the new version of Nirishima Hex in the fantasy world. I got to play Nanti Narking. Neelan, how's my pronunciation? I Vaguely right. Is it not Sherlock Dang. themed. The redo of the Disc of Morkoporf. Okay, no. Discworld Unk Morpork. Oh uh, yeah. The right. redo of the Discworld of Morkoporf game. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, that's it. I got to play Wavelength. I got to play we're doomed. I got to play The Menace Among Us. Many, many board games. Just had a, a fantastic time. Party games, telestrations, the whole bit. I don't want to give too many impressions, and I think we'll all try them together. The two that I wanted to softly cover for a second, both We're Doomed and The Menace Among Us, are sort of social deduction-y games. In We're Doomed, you're playing a coup-like game in real time, where you are 
building a rocket ship together and there's a 15 minute timer and there's an event deck and the event deck says lol your win condition changed don't read this to anyone or one player is killed didn't work for me i don't think it works for many people and it's like if the event deck is good it's funny but it's not really much of a game but i would like to see you guys try it at least for one 15 minute cycle because i think you'll get a kick out of the real-time aspect of it the menace among us is a redo of Battlestar Galactica. It's a can we do Battlestar Galactica in one hour? We've heard this promise before. We've heard this promise in Dark Moon. I am not sold on The Menace Among Us, but I think we need Neelan, our chief shadow officer, to try it. There is a communication restriction in The Menace Among Us, which prevents you from talking about the card that you played, but allows you to speculate about the cards that others played. And it's the wonkiest paragraph restriction that makes me want to dislike the game from the get-go i had decent rounds of it i played it back to back but i would like to run it at least once with you guys may get a chance to do this at like dice tower west dice tower con i feel like that's a kind of a good convention game some interesting things going on but the game that everyone should be talking about the game that everyone should be trying to play wavelength i played a lot of wavelength myself over the holiday break how did you acquire a new game did you con a grandma it was gifted to me of course it was gifted wavelength is a party game where you divide into two teams and you try to communicate with each other on a spectrum so on a player's turn they will get a spectrum and that spectrum could be good to bad that's a fairly easy spectrum you know and then there's this nice physical beautiful apparatus that will give you a percentage essentially on the map that scores four points and then flanking that so it might be at 80 percent of the way full and flanking that at 70 and 90 is three points so if you get it right in the middle it's four points and if you flank it it's three points and if you flank that it's two points and no one can see that but you and you have to give a clue on a scale of good to bad that will make them turn the dial turn the dial right into that sweet spot so 80 percent good to bad mark yeah not what i would say but sure (laughs) but 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 what makes the game so much fun so interesting is that those scales change that scale could be unattractive man to attractive man and then suddenly you know when you say matt damon what do you mean by matt damon because if you meant the hottest man alive you might say brad pitt you know matt damon is clearly not brad pitt so I mean, is he better than half? Who can say? He's better than Nicolas Cage. He's not better than... (laughs) So the game becomes this question of, well, what's the extreme, right? Like, what... what, If they meant all the way, what would they say? Right. Illegal behavior to legal behavior. And it's like, well, you know, murdering someone is very illegal. Like, what is jaywalking? Yeah. Right? Because it's not a legal activity. It's illegal activity. And so there is tons of discussions, tons of hilarious moments where people have very different understandings. What did you think of Wavelength, Mark? I really, really liked it. First of all, the production and all that goes into it is fantastic. The dial that you use to set where it's going to fall in the spectrum, the way the spectrum, the answer is revealed, the way it all fits into the box is just great. The scoring track is built into the box. Everything is sort of self-contained into the box in a very, very fantastic way. The way that you rotate the dial even provides feedback. Yeah. It clicks uh, a little at nice. you. And it reminds me, you know, and it's something that you may not realize, is that even when car manufacturers make their vehicles, they're thinking about how much the button depresses and what that feels like and trying to standardize it across the car. It's very clear when you play Wavelength that some of that thought process has gone into it. Right. Although the one issue I have with the production... Locking. No, locking is fine. Oh, really? Well, maybe we're talking about the unlocking because you have to be careful not to accidentally spin the spinner when you unlock. But it's a minor gripe. I feel like this is a game that will stay in my collection. However, the one issue I have with it is... It's a party game, certainly, right? But when the clue giver is trying to figure out what clue to give and they're debating what clue to give on the spectrum, in my experience, it's been really tough for a lot of players to do it. And so it just grinds the night to a halt where people are just trying to figure out like overrated actor, underrated actor. Well, I'm at 30% who falls into that category. And they're just like agonizing over it and trying to figure it out. And then everybody's just sort of sitting around. And sure, we're chatting about other things, but I think maybe implementing a timer or something, just like forcing somebody to get an answer out and get to the fun stuff. But I just found in all my plays of it, I must have played it like eight or nine times over the, over the break. That was the one thing that was a drawback. Yeah, I think speaking of fathers, my father could not grok this. Yeah. And he's not a game player at all, but like... He was excited to like sing us a song as his clue 
but then it was a happy song and he was trying to get us to do a sad thing, but he didn't really understand how the, like, the dial worked, honestly. Yeah. Like he thought he could then move the dial, but we had explained it a couple of times. And there's a lot of clue restrictions if you're wanting to try hard it. So I don't recommend really explaining those to people because it's like it has to express one idea and can't be a compound idea and it can't be of or related to a ratio. There's a lot of those little wonkiness. What I will say is that This falls very strongly for me in the party games that should not be scored. I do not think the scoring works at all. And actually, it was what I thought you were going to say. Okay. Because if a team is losing by more than four points, they just get to keep taking turns. You only play to 10 points. And in the rule book, it's like, if your team is losing by four or more points, you just keep taking turns. And so when people compare it, it's being compared to code names, which I think is lovely. I mean, it's fantastic to even be in the conversation with something as good as Codenames. But I will say that if you're looking for that strong competitiveness to it, I've probably played it 15 times over break. And I think there was maybe one game that felt like it was even approaching the tension that comes into a Codenames game when you're getting down to the end and feeling like there might be some kind of scoring. I stopped scoring it about halfway through and probably will never score it again. We played with scoring. What I just did is like we just rotated back and forth and back and forth, regardless of where like how far a team was. And scoring was a completely like secondary thought. But I just thought that the scoring restriction sort of ended a game where it should end. You ended ten points and that just felt like a good time to end it. A couple times we just played it where everybody on the team got one opportunity to be the clue giver. Right. That's mostly how we played it. I think what scoring does that's nice is once a team has guessed The other team gets to go, is it more that way or more that way to score one point? And And I think letting them in it. So there's some engagement for the opposite team as well. And I think that's fun to do, even if you don't score. Sure, sure. So I have one question. I've not played this. You described something when you were describing like the way, like say the idea of the Matt Damon, Brad Pitt. So is there like a personal bias to a lot of these questions or is it i'm putting to mind as something like where we describe something like true colors where you're like revealing a little bit about the person as you're playing it does it have a lot of that or is it a bit drier than that it's a bit drier than yeah. that i okay. think that there could be overrated actor to underrated actor there okay. you know there are some morality based questions okay. that kind of reveal something so there but, will be moments where someone's just like wait how can you think that? yeah like we had a more than one time that somebody said sure she might think that we don't like yeah, is it, is it what I think? What does she think we think? Is it what I think? Is it what they think? Or is it what the world thinks? Okay. Yeah, it's a very common sort okay. of framework. Christina, the blue tank, commented that it's sort of like at its best, it approaches a True Colors vibe for a few moments, but maybe you should just be playing True Colors. Okay. But this is much more easily accessible for big groups of people. And it is good because you can get it out and you can be playing in about 30 seconds because you just put the scale down, you say what it is, and then you literally physically hand the box to someone and say, move the dial where you think this should be. Yeah. I mean, just the thing is, you're absolutely right about that. But your turn will be 30 seconds because you're familiar with the game. But like... Then it can, again, did you have the experience that it got sort of grinding? Yes. Yeah. And I played a, a round of it, I think, with 20 people in the audience where I gave every clue. Like, so right. the way <laughs> that we played the game is Kellen got a new card and then tried to make people laugh while also, sure. you know, and that was enjoyable. Yes, yes. I provide that sort of entertainment <laughs> for people. Your audience. So that is Wavelength. Neilan, I think you should 100% percent I I, I would love to, yeah. I mean, Wolfgang Walsh, in any time of day, I would happily play one of his games. And I've been itching to try this for a while. So, yeah, I would love to do it. So now on to our featured topic for the day. That topic is on our board game, Resolutions for the Year 2020. I have such a hard time even saying the year 2020 because I think I'm in Blade Runner (laughs) and not the Australian kind. I think of 2020 with Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs. You don't know who those are. People are. Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs? I know Barbara Walters, but what is 2020? Look it up. You're an old man. Look it up on the internet. You know that you're closer, actually, (laughs) you are not closer in age to my father than to me, um, because I calculated it the other way, Christina. (laughs) I thought you were going to say closer to death or something. Oh, no, that would be great. Um, So, board game resolutions. I think that the function of having a board game podcast changes the way that you play and interact with board games. I think that the more years you have in the hobby, your mindset changes, towards how you play games and how you collect games and and what you want from board games. So I think it's always important to think about, to project, and sort of put on paper what you're interested in doing for the upcoming year. So with that said, who wants to give us, Neelan, do you want to give us your board game resolution for 2020? Totally. This is born of a couple of things. I I think in general, I've had the smallest collection of the three of us for a while. A lot of that is born out of 
just having been in the game for less time, I would say. I found my collection ballooning in ways that I didn't anticipate in this last year, just because of the rate at which we've been acquiring games recently, and also just at the infrequency that I've been able to play games over the last year. So one of the things I sort of wanted to quite heavily start to do as soon as possible is just actively cut games out of my collection. And this is something we end up talking about a lot, but this is the most I've felt in a long time that I could probably cull a third of the games in my collection quite easily. So Neon is known for keeping all of the insert <laughs> uh, for his board games. Do you keep the insert if you get rid of the game? Uh, no, the reason you keep the insert is so you can put it back into the box when you get rid of it, obviously. And so what, what is driving you to do that? Because you live alone, um, sad man. Um, <laughs> what? That's good. <laughs> yep, that's, you know, is that good? Well, yeah, I, I, I feel great. <laughs> about, yeah. <laughs> Come on, what do you mean? No, we've I'm, been doing this for years. We've been doing this for years. Yeah, it's all good. I'm a, I'm a lonely, sad man. Let's, You're let's a lonely, moving. sad man who yeah. sleeps with his inserts. And you have a very nice apartment with plenty of space. Thank you. Um, because I come here when you're not here, because I have your keys. <laughs> And so what, what would downsizing do for you? It's not motivated by anything pragmatic so much as just... We've spoken a lot. I, I know Mark will disagree with this but the burden of ownership of some of these games because a lot of what i feel when i have these games sitting on my shelf unplayed is sort of just this mental burden of like man i should play that again and realistically i shouldn't play it again because the only reason i feel like i should play it again is because i own it right whereas if i was to be sensible about the emotional investment i have in that game i would have played it at some point in the lot so let's take for example fury for dracula which is a game I have of unplayed. Dracula. Sorry, Fury of Dracula. If you had played it, maybe. If I might know that, yeah. Which is a game I've had unplayed on my shelf for probably about three years. Whenever it went out of print, that's when I snagged my copy of it. I still have this emotional thing in my brain telling me, oh, I should play that sometimes. Realistically, I don't want to play it, or I would have played it by now, <laughs> right? But honestly, very real. Like I, Well, you say very real, but do you want to play it? Only because I see it, you know, because I see it every day. Okay. Like, if I didn't have it on my shelf, I probably would never think about it ever again. Right. I agree with that. But, like, do you want to play for your Dracula? Like, I get, like, if you didn't have it, you wouldn't be dying for it. But, like, do you want to? Let's play it. Like, but but like, I could say that about a hundred other games. Let's get a right? hundred other games. <laughs> no, that, you're missing the point, Mark. <laughs> I've, uh, I've never wanted to play Fury for Dracula. But if I did, <laughs> it's like... You just need that one other person to spark, right? Because every time spark you right here. Every time you've said Fury for Dracula, I kind of like look away because I don't want you to call on me to play it with you. <laughs> right, right. No, but I think that's part of it. Is that like for me as someone that is to be very real, like partly quite an anxious person, these things weigh on my mind in a way. Where the thing I started to do in recent years, which is actually quite distressing, is itemize my entertainment. Like, oh, these are the films I need to watch. These are the shows I need to do. These are the video games I need to play. And having these games on my shelf is my itemized list of games I sure. tell myself I need to play, which is just not a realistic goal and not one that's good for me or even the podcast because there are so many games other games I feel more excited to play that I would feel more invested in informing people about. Fury of Dracula is not one of them, right? It's an archaic design. Not that I know about it specifically, but it's not a game that would be super informative for myself or the podcast. Does that relate to the same for video games? Like the games in your Steam library? Yeah. Like, Do you actively not buy games or try to delete games off your hard drive in the same way that you're kind of talking about Absolutely. Now. There was a point in time where Steam sales were like one of the most important things. I'm going to look at the games that are like down 80% and just add them to my collection. I have made an active promise with video games specifically that I won't buy a game until five minutes before I'm about to play it. Who did you promise? Myself. Because you have no one. <laughs> yeah, I have no one else to promise. Um, yeah, one of the nights I was just sitting on my own, sadly and alone in the dark, I just said to myself... This is where it ends. <laughs> uh, I will not buy video games unless I'm... But, but seriously, unless I'm planning on playing them immediately. And it's part of the same thing with board games. The drive to acquire without the drive to actually want to play that game specifically is something I just want to 
I want to do less of. What pushed you over edge? Was it like seeing a number for your collection or was it just the feeling of having the games around or what was it? It's, it it's the feeling because even just like right now, yeah. like I'm literally surrounded on all three sides by board games in piles that are not organized. They're not in a good place right. on my shelf. A lot of them, are, the reason that they're out in view is actually as a reminder to play them. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's just a drive or an impulse I don't need. There's enough stuff that I'm excited, actively excited to play that to feel like these other games are just sort of nagging at the edge of my consciousness. I don't need it. Yeah. And so when you envision Neelan as he enters 2021, you know, f- fresh and spry and much younger than Mark, <laughs> uh, still, that's how it works. What do you feel like you will have accomplished as a result of this um, reduction? I think what will remain is a shelf of games that I am feeling actively excited to pursue so sort of like a vibrancy for like wanting to sort of play every single one of them be like okay these are the games that i know that uh, these are the people i'm going to play them with this is the time that we're going to do it i've spoken to this individual about saying we're going to do this at some point rather than just this nebulous and just just to level set right we're not talking to the board gamer who's either new to games or has 20 games or has 30 games we're talking about like 100 games yeah, right the, the, yeah, my, my like, collection okay. is like 100 and something at this point i just want to like level set Sh- sure. for people yeah. who may be listening yeah so Sorry. uh no 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 that i think that's absolutely valid because I, I think that a lot of the times that this discussion comes up and when we've had it with people in the past you realize that you're not even having the same conversation as someone that's sort of like oh yeah i'm going to kill my collection and they're talking about a one of the 10 or 15 games they have like the burden of games gets more at a certain level although i think it's a very common thing to see you know you go to reddit or you go to board game geek and people who are new to the hobby will express that they've gone through a binging period when they first get into the hobby they just buy a bunch of games so there are different levels obviously but i think it's a common issue people have where they look up and they realize that they've just acquired all these games and they don't really know why or you know they lose track of the playing in light of the acquiring yeah mark what is your resolution for 2020 as it relates to board game (laughs) well it's funny that you say that because as a whole i'm not really one for resolutions i feel like you know neilan just mentioned the idea of having this burden of ownership for games that he has that he hasn't played which is something that i don't feel or connect with at all i'd never have that feeling well he also owns a home (laughs) so tied into that for me is rejecting the idea of self-imposing restrictions because i see them as something that it's great to do it so let's just go for it but like having them as a resolution makes me feel like all i'm doing is inviting a negative feeling is your resolution to not have a resolution (laughs) No, my resolutions have a million resolutions. I've heard some people talk about New Year's resolutions this year as more like small habits, sure, um, as opposed to like here's the goal, and if I don't reach this goal, like I'm going to beat myself up. Which is sort of where my question, like, what does Neil yeah. hope to uh, to get on the no, other right, end? right, exactly, so, yeah. So uh, that's just sort of as a proviso that I, for me, I just I'm not into like structured resolutions because i just feel like all it does is negative stuff but a couple things that i am aiming to do one is a little more simple more sort of shallow is i want to play more 18xx games i've acquired a couple uh, over the last year and i'm uh, eager to play them and that sort of dovetails into my bigger thing which is to play the games that i love more but especially the games that i love that my closest friends haven't played and to introduce them to those games like one of the things i'm most eager to do this year is to play an 18xx game with you guys and to play brass with you and like to introduce the games that i love the most with the people i'm closest to that's sort of a focus i feel like i have for the new year yeah there's a, another new york times article that was going around that a member of our discord longtime sunshine shared with christina who shared with me <laughs> and then i thought i was the one bringing the information to the masses but actually i wasn't about the unexpected joy of repeat experiences which is this concept that you may think that what you actually want to do is play the shiny new game but actually revisiting something that you have loved in the past can in fact generate more feelings of warmth or more feelings of satisfaction and so sometimes that shiny new thing may seem in fact like it's what you want to do but then once you get into playing brass for the fifth time this year you may actually in fact enjoy that more and that's something i've been thinking about in tangentially just went and saw uncut gems um, and i went and saw it for a second time in the past two weeks and normally i would use this framework of like well that's a waste of time when there's 70 new movies out Um, and i had a great time seeing it again um, and kind of experiencing it with christina 
she hated it, so that was a bust. <laughs> but kind of sharing that together and, and thinking about repeat experiences is something I've been thinking about. If you're interested in reading, this is called The Unexpected Joy of Repeat Experiences by Leah uh, Fessler, and it was published on November 7th of last year in the New York Times. Yeah, I, I read it and I thought it was a uh, enlightening, interesting article. The other thing, all my resolutions as they are, uh, just sort of are trying to focus me into playing games optimally. And sort of along that point, I love logging games. I love the statistical side, but I'd like to take that a step further and maybe write some reviews or like even like memorialize my plays even deeper, you know, not just have them logged, but maybe write about the games and put reviews out. I was nodding my head because I thought you were about to get rid of uh, the fact that you log games, oh, and then you went not where I thought you'd go. Going the opposite. Double down. Yeah. You want to know how long each player's turn has been right, in every exactly. game, and what they were wearing, and what they ate for dinner that night, right. and how much sleep they had had, which could, in fact, or how much alcohol they had ingested, which could mental hit their mental framework, which might impact their ability to... Um, cognizize or beat you at the game that you were playing. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I, I will say this. like When I first started logging games, I inherited a lot of Mark's logs because I just thought, what's the easiest way to jumpstart my logging is just to yeah. strip every game that I had played in Mark's logs. And his early games were like riddled with little notes about the play sessions. It was actually one of the most like know. interesting and fun things I about should, reading you know back what? That's my that. resolution. I'm going to start putting notes back in the back into I, I do wish I, I kept doing that. That would be great because I do like looking back and reading those little yeah. notes. So yeah, those are my sort of sum up what I'm aiming for this year in terms of gaming. We saved the best for last. I wanted to describe a feeling five years ago when I was looking at the Cthulhu Wars Kickstarter. I saw all the expansions and promos and I saw Mr. Cthulhu and friends and I just wanted all of it. I wanted to own all of it. And there was this part of it that my game collection, you know, if there was a promo for Dominion, I had to have it. You know, there were two expansions to Dominion and there were four promos and I had to order one on Board Game Geek and I had to buy one on eBay. And I went out of my way to get all of that, acquire all of that, even though the, everyone knows the promos are garbage. They don't increase the gameplay. Over the years, I've lost that completionist attitude. And I think that that is for the best. But the words that we use to describe are collection or our library are very interesting to me. And so my New Year's resolution for 2020 is very simple, is to play all of the games that I have not played. And so there's two facets to that. But before I do, I just wanted to, off the top of my head, <laughs> off the top of my head, just say some of the games that we're talking about. Mezzo, Living Planet, Rumble Nation, A Whole New World, Hadara, Empires of the North, Dragon Scales, All Manner of Evil, Wild Lands, Ad Astra, Vanuatu, Spartacus, 15 Men, Earth Reborn, Sakura Arms, Elysium, Barony. These aren't even new games, right? They're just games that I've had on my shelf. Most of these are in shrink. So that's kind of the level of problem we're dealing with. We're talking about probably more than 40 games that are either in shrink or have never been played. Some of that comes as a function of getting review copies for the Board Game Barrage podcast, but I just don't like that. So that's the goal in small. When you enlarge that, that could be one of two things. That's either playing the game, making a plan to play the game, or getting rid of the game. So in some ways, it's related to Neilan's idea of, of what he wants to have. But I think I'm circling around this concept, and I'm sure it exists somewhere else because everything exists somewhere else, including me. It's the year 2020, after all. Is this idea of a living library. I think that you can have a collection, and I think the, the word collection is the wrong thing that I want for a collection of board games. I want a library of games that I know how to play and games that I am, in fact, playing. And thinking about a game from the function of, well, five years from now, my child may play that. Well, I don't have a child. <laughs> um, Neelan, uh, if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, you know he has a lot of children, um, which is why his game library is filled with... Haba games. Haba games for children. And that's where um, the third of my collection is going, just distributed across the country. To all your children. But because I used to have that thought, like, oh, this game is fun and light, and I should have it for when I have a kid. And I just, I don't buy that premise anymore. And I think that some of the joy of collecting, like I mentioned when I was getting all of Mr. Cthulhu and Friends, I was getting all of that content, that feeling of having a collection is gone now right now. And so I'd like to figure out how to reestablish that through 
the culling and curating of what I believe to be a library of games that provides the experiences that I want. So I've coined that a living library from collection to living <laughs> library. TM. So wait, are you saying that you are looking to re acquire which is sort of a pun but reacquire that feeling of you're looking to scratch that collector itch but in this new way yeah in a sense okay. that's too ephemeral right? right so the goal is have no games unplayed right okay. because that's concrete that we can check the box sure but if i want to be like neon and i want to talk about my feelings that's what i hope <laughs> that does sound like me that's what i hope to get to um, through this process is without being a one who collects, right? Yeah. Without being one who just buys everything, what can that like living library look like? Even a library is wrong because I used to think Carl Chudiak has designed my favorite game of all time, Innovation, which we talked about in the previous episode of the show. I used to think I needed to own all of Carl Chudiak's yeah. games, and I don't like all of Carl Chudiak's <laughs> games. I do not need to own all of Carl Chudiak's games. Right. But your ideal situation is to have a library, a collection, whatever the term is, of games that you are playing regularly and know the rules of. That is your ideal situation? Correct. Out of curiosity, out of my own curiosity, what number is that, do you think? I mean, I think in a perfect world <laughs> where there was no podcast, <laughs> right? Sure. that number would be under 75 is my hot take. In the current world, I don't know that we're going to get there, which is why the goal is get rid of all your right. unplayed games. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that you know, for the longest time, I have had schedule Cthulhu Wars Onslaught 3 with friends. Yeah. And that was on my to-do list from August through the end of the year. I finally got to play it. I had a fantastic five-player game of Cthulhu Wars with friend of the podcast, Brandon. That's dumb. If you want to do a thing, do a thing. I don't know. Seize the day. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Carpe... Knocked him, <laughs> as the um, children say. I think similarly smaller little things. I really want to try a train game. Um, 1889 is what I'm hoping for, but I will settle for other things. And we also were given a entire magic cube by Sogeki Dan, another friend of the podcast on the Discord. We got to do this. Yeah, it's absolutely. beautiful. It's ready to go. We just need to schedule the night and get it done. Yeah. One thing we wanted to talk about is we have a huge Discord community. You can go to boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord, uh, which is D-I-S-C-O-R-D, and join a chat room of gamers, uh, hundreds of gamers talking all day, every day. Yeah. It's a super cool place to talk about board games. And one of the things that popped up organically in December is this idea of a contest uh, that's now happening. It's called the Contest 2020. And this is a group of gamers who have decided not to buy any board games in 2020. So this is being run by Wa Wilson, the Steel Blue tank. He has graciously decided to help moderate the Discord for us. And this contest is, is very official. There are rule books, there are sign-up sheets, and they're very serious about what they're hoping to get from not buying any games and just feeling like their collections are already in a good enough place that they don't need to buy any more games in 2020. It is a hilarious channel to participate in because everyone else who's not participating is going in there and being like, hey guys, did you see the Oath Kickstarter is starting next week? You know, like, wow, Oath looks great. Like, or here's a board game sale on Amazon. So there's this taunting and lovely fun that's happening with this contest. There are rules and honor systems, rewards, consequences. There's a green tank challenge that I'm going to be giving a prize to for the person who has the best chain of trades. So if you can trade a paperclip for PAX Premier Second Edition, you'd be in the running for that. One of the punishments is that you have to go to KFC and prove... It is not a punishment. <laughs> well, that is definitely not a punishment. That's true. And you could come to my house and we could get there very quickly. <laughs> but there is a fact uh, of all of the ways in which, you know, everyone is trying to come up with ways to break the rules of this contest. But they have graciously agreed to allow any uh, new members to join the contest for a week after this episode comes out. So if you're interested in that, that is a channel on the Discord called The Contest 2020. We wish them the best. I thought about joining and then bought a board game after January. <laughs> and just to be clear, like it's serious with the rules and they're taking it seriously you know the, the intention is there there's a genuine intention there but it's also very very lighthearted as well like 
as Kellen mentioned, they're like ribbing each other. They're talking about the upcoming Kickstarters. And people are going into this contest knowing that they're definitely going to like get, bow out. And, right. Yeah, bow out in a couple of months. Point. So it's just fun, but it's there's like an optimistic, positive vibe to it. Yeah. Like you said, there's positive sincerity to it where people will show up and be like, oh, I, I had to return a game. Do I do I still lose? Like this very like, am I bending the rules by right. doing this? I, I love it. Like just like the sincerity of like, I don't want to lose the contest, but this thing happened. And, right. Yeah. It, it's great. Yeah, it's very, very good. Yeah, it's like, will Eric Lang release you know the new onk. onk game you know hopefully it's after july because i kind of want to win this contest <laughs> right. so uh, a fantastic board game resolution but please join the discord and uh, share what your board game resolution is for the year 2020 i think mark you are right that setting up firm goals with the expectation that you might fail them can lead to anger but i do think that the in my opinion the goal of setting goals is actually just the the thinking. Yeah. In the thinking about your future, you can make real um, what you think. Sure. I, like, I, agree, I agree with that. You should have a target in order to get where you want to go, basically. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I think I already did, but we'll, we'll let the editing do that. Um, we are bringing back fan favorite things that we're looking forward to uh in the next little while whether that's board game related or not so i'm gonna bring it back full circle because i think the very first time we ever did this years and years ago what i was excited about was an upcoming math trade and i am excited about two upcoming math trades both the local strategic con math trade which is coming up in a couple weeks and the dice tower west math trade which is coming up uh, a month after that so i am gearing up they're already uh open for people submitting the list of their games. So I'm getting psyched up about those two math trades. Trades are legal for the contest, so you can trade away and still be eligible to win the prizes. My favorite part of Mark doing math trades is watching him shuttle everything to Las Vegas that's on right. the planes and scrambling for road boxes. Tripping. Road making oh, us that's take true, actually. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have, we're have two cars, one for us and one for one us. One for games, yeah. That's right, exactly. The thing I am excited for in the immediate future is one of my most anticipated games of 2019 that I spoke about a couple of times probably last year is Sanctum. We've just received a review copy of this and we're hoping to play it in the very near future. I'm excited for this. This is a game that replicates one of my favorite style of video games, like the Diablo style loot game. It is very much unapologetically Diablo, I should say, even from the art all the way down to a lot of the intricacies of the design. And yeah, I'm excited to give this a go. It seems neat. One of the things that is organizing on the Discord right now is a meetup on the West Coast and a meetup on the East Coast, uh, lovingly called BGB East and BGB West. BG Beast is the East one. Is it really? Yeah, BG Beast. Super excited to see groups of people get together and yeah. play board games. I don't know much about BGB East, but you can join the Discord uh, if you're interested in hearing about that. BGB West will be taking place on 125, Saturday 125, at the Dragon and Meeple. So we're going to be there playing games. Who can say what time? I don't actually know yet. It's still being organized. Did you just refer to January 25th as 125? I've never heard that before. 125? What are you talking about? 125. Is that just like a common way to refer to a no, date? No, it's not a common way. Well, yes, of course it is. 125? Would it's you the say calendar day? Why you said it twice. I was like, that, that's not a thing. But that's not how you would say it. Like, hey, meet me on 125 at the Dragon and Meeple. January 25th. Okay. How would you uh, write we're that in America. In shorthand? How would I mean, you write yeah, that in shorthand? In, in written you would write yeah, written form. Dash totally, 25. In the what the hell is that word, day? Look at this paper. I've I know. never heard it spoken out as 125. Listeners, go on the Discord and tell us who's right. Have you ever been in a business meeting? No. <laughs> Neither of you have. <laughs> 125, 224. What do you mean? 330, no, I, 330 If I tell somebody my phone number, I say it's 276 down. I don't write the word T-W-O. This is 2020. We're trying to save people time. <laughs> okay. This is the future. <laughs> okay. Look at that. 125. Well, Saturday, 125. What do you mean? Okay, because I feel what like... What are you talking look, about? I'm, show I'm showing up at 125 if you tell me that. Yeah. Well, I don't know what this time it starts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it could Hopefully start at 125. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, very excited to do that. So if you're in and around the Los Angeles area and are interested in gaming, I'm sure we will get that going. Yeah, we'll be there. That's going to do it for this episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. You can find us anywhere on social media. You can find us on Patreon if you're looking for bonus episodes of the podcast. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. If you don't want to chat in real time, you can chat with us 
the old-fashioned way, the forum way, the 1995 way, on boardgamebarrage.com slash guilt, um, where we love to sit and chat with you. As always, thank you to Heart Society for letting us use their song, What's On Your Mind, Kid, from their album, Wake the Queens. So long. Bye-bye. Why are you laughing at me? See you at 125. On 125. See you at 125. I don't... I, I don't... I want to be cognizant of two things, and I waited till now. One thing I will say in the new year, the cobwebs, I drove 90% of the way to Neilan's old apartment. Really? Which we haven't been to in... Today you did that? Yeah. Wow. But I put it in what, Google really? Maps because I had it saved. Okay. They're both saved oh, under Neilan. I, I get that then. And I, got, I did that once to your apartment, actually. Oh, to the other one? Yeah. And I'm like, it does not take this long to get to Neilan's. <laughs> yeah. Like, the traffic in LA can't be this bad. Right. But it was just me. I'm the bad. Right. Two things I want to be cognizant of. One. Okay, I was glad that wasn't one of those. Because I'm like, why am I going <laughs> well, to be cognizant of your <laughs> Yes. Don't drive to Neyland's place. Um, ooh, this is, I think it's going to sound better. Okay. I think. Many of you may not know that for the past year, I have had a superior microphone. And that has sort of been the secret. <laughs> <laughs> to my success, you know, Michael Jordan, what did he have? The Nikes. The Nikes, right. What did Tiger Woods have? A golf club brand that I don't know. I think know it was of. a Nike also. And then once, Nike. once you level that playing field, I'm just not sure what my unique value proposition. You're like Michael Jordan without the Nikes. Exactly. That's right. You know? Sad state of affairs. So. What's the uh, South African equivalent of Michael Jordan? Hmm. Yeah, I don't have that. Um, I was going to say Oscar Pistorius, but that's, that's <laughs> not the best story. <laughs> ha ha ha! Sports joke. Don't know who that is. Or is that he's not a sportsman? No, he's, he's a, a sportsman, sportsman who yeah. murdered his girlfriend. Yeah, he's a sportsman with the the, the runner with no legs. They called him the Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. You know Blade Runner? Wait, he cut off his girlfriend's leg. Yeah, he uh, cut off his yeah, girlfriend's leg exactly and then killed it. it. No, he. All right. Okay. Oh. Let's get serious. Two things. One. Hello and welcome to 2020. No, I don't know that that, because we've already there. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Yes. Hello and welcome to the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, card games, no. party games, the latest hot... Is that our new... We're changing the slogan? New slogan? Well, I just want people to know that we like to party. Narking. Before Nancy, you go on narking. too far, sure. Like, did you want to put me as the garbage in the middle? <laughs> the garbage review in the middle? Oh, or? I forgot. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I don't care because no, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm happy to go. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Why not? We do often call you the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> you are green like garbage. Like Oscar the Grouch. Okay. Seems perfect. Quick and breezy. I think we want it breezy. Yeah. We want it snippy snappy. All right. Just give them Snap the Snap a ding dong. Cut all the fat out. Get to the meat. Um, Speaking of fat... <laughs> I stepped onto my scale after the new year, and it's one of those Bluetooth scales, you know, so it oh. thinks it's it thinks it's something, right, you know, and it, and it recorded the weight on my phone, and then I got a pop-up notification. I'm like, what? This is not normal. And the pop-up notification was like, there's such a large discrepancy <laughs> between your weight before the holidays and after the holidays. Like, are you sure? Like, manual override. And I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you scale? <laughs> Uh, and then I disconnected its batteries. <laughs> I no longer own a scale. Show him who's boss.